We are celebrating Bite Medicine's 100th webinar. I was going to get out some Prosecco and things, but I thought apparently that might be a bit unprofessional. But uh, alas, I have an alternative. I'd like to introduce you to my uh, younger and far more handsome brother. One second. Here he is. Say hi. His name's Jasper. He's named after my dad's urology registrar. And uh, he's our, one of our many mascots. Half of the bite medicine team have dogs. I think we're going to do a, a dogs of bite medicine post at one time. But yes, to celebrate our 100th webinar, Jasper says hi. And uh, well, we're going to have a lot of fun and we're going to win some prizes and stuff. Let me, uh, let me send him back to uh, where he belongs. Without further ado, we can uh, crack on. Um, welcome, welcome to those of you who are just joining now. Um, as I was saying to everyone, you know, the, our, it's our hundredth webinar. It's, a, it's an honor to have been around for even just been around for only a year and a bit, and all of your support has just been absolutely fantastic. So thank you for your ongoing support. Um, and I, you know, I hope you're all having a good summer. If you're back at med school or back at you know started your PA course again then I hope it's gone smoothly and we are here to support you every step of the way. Um, we have run a few competitions now in, in terms of competitions and grants and stuff we've given out, we've given out a few thousand pounds and you know these are a couple of our smaller competitions that we're running surgery and medicine. Um, I'm going to explain to you how uh, our competitions work and hopefully we won't have any technical hiccups either but Yes, prizes to be won, certificates to be won, mugs to be won, uh, money to be won, and premium membership for a year to be won. So quite a lot. Um, but the thing that most people seem to want is the certificate to add to your portfolio, which is always a nice, a nice to have. So yes, our targeting audience is basically all of you, I, I suspect. So medical students in your clinical years, physician associates, and basically everyone internationally. Um, the questions that we ask are based on UK guidelines predominantly. Um, so the things like NICE guidelines, British Society or Royal College guidelines. Uh, I suspect this will last around 60 minutes and maybe a little bit less, but we'll see. There are 20 questions in today's competition. Um, and there are going to be 45 seconds per question. And for the first 17 questions, uh, or yeah, for basically for the first, uh, other than the final three questions, all the other questions, it doesn't matter how long you take, as long as you answer within that 45 seconds, everyone will get the same number of points. The thing that often discriminates a little bit more is those final three questions, where the faster you answer, the more points you will score. Um, so yes, you know, the vast majority of this competition is it's not speed it's accuracy and those last three are a little bit of both speed and accuracy um, it will make a lot more sense as we uh, as we get on uh, but yes of course if anything doesn't make sense feel free to ask questions in the chat or in the Q&A um, the content is derived from our surgical specialties I'm sure you know we've covered loads of surgical special uh, surgical topics both in terms of webinars and in our textbook as well. Um, so that's where all of this is derived from. We've got brief explanations after each question, which I'll give to you just so things make a little bit more sense. Um, a little bit more in terms of what you need to do so that you get your prizes. Um, we already clarified what the prizes are, but in order for you to actually get them, um, when you register on Mentimeter, which is the competition software that we use, ensure that you register with your full name. Now this will help us, of course, identify you. When we get to the leaderboard at the end, only the top 10 people are shown. 
So there's nothing to, to worry about. Um, if you are placed in the top three, i.e. you're eligible for a prize, um, then take a picture or screenshot of the leadership board, uh, sorry, the leaderboard that you see at the end of the quiz. It will be very obvious when we get there. And I'll remind you at that point to make sure you've screenshotted that page. And then email uh, admin at biomedicine.com with that screenshot and we will confirm your position. Um, but unfortunately, if you don't follow those instructions, you can't claim your prize. They're really straightforward instructions. Um, and then we will send you your money, we'll send you your mug, we'll send you whatever you've won. Um, and yeah, so it's just a little bit of fun, but and you, have, you can win some stuff, but it's, it's to, to learn at the same time as well. But as I said, any questions as we go along, uh, feel free to ask. Um, before we dive in, please do check out our multi-step SBA question bank. We've got loads of new things and, and uh, resources and all sorts of exciting things coming out in the next uh, next few months as well. We've got our textbook, which is being updated every single week. Um, and of course, our webinars, one of which you are attending today. So let's get you all signed into Menti now. So hopefully you can all see this page. Now, what we need you to do is we need you to sign up. So if you go over to, like it says at the top there, menti.com, um, as some of you are doing already, head over to menti.com, use the code 408061 40 80 61 9 and we can dive into our first question now i know it is summertime so we're expecting far fewer numbers than what we usually get but um that's all the more advantage for you to win i think in the summer last time we had almost a thousand ish people do our competition during that first lockdown now i'm suspecting a lot less than that um so do join us um because all to play for and all to gain and nothing to lose, I guess, is the, uh, is the phrase. Um, I will make sure everyone has joined. So I'll give it another 30 seconds, because if you don't join now, you will struggle to join later on. And as soon as we have a few more people, I will start the countdown. Uh, I'll give it until 10 past, just to make sure everyone has had the opportunity to join if you're having any technical issues now is your time to speak it is now 10 past we will be commencing and i'm going to start the countdown so i hope you're all ready with on your phone or ipad or whatever it is let's dive in countdown starting all correct answers give max point Now, hopefully you can see this question slightly bigger than it's shown on the screen here, but you should be able to see it properly on your uh, device. Do I need to join with my real name? Ideally join with your real name, it makes our life a lot easier, but if you don't, as long as you send your screenshot, it's okay. But let me stay quiet now. Nice, well done. Nice, easy question uh, to start off with. 56 of you getting that correct, so the majority. So, can anyone tell me in the chat? Well, I've got it on the screen there now. Maybe if you can see that. Tell me in the chat now before I go into it, what condition have this patient presented with? Or well, most likely based on that brief description I gave you. Yeah, probably cholecystitis, or some complication of gallstone disease. So likely cholecystitis. Um, and first line uh, imaging of choice is a transabdominal ultrasound. The other explanations are here. I'm not going to dwell on, to, on all of them. I will upload these slides uh, as soon as we're done on this webinar. But yes, a transabdominal ultrasound. This patient is a classic demographic kind of middle-aged uh, woman. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, two key risk factors for uh gallstone disease in general with the incidence rising as you grow older as well so lovely transabdominal ultrasound first line for acute cholecystitis in terms of imaging okay question number two
A 65-year-old man presents to his GP with intermittent diarrhea for the past six months. He has no other symptoms. What is the best next step? Remember, there's no rush to answer these ones. These, everyone gets the same number of points. Three, two, one. Ooh, a bit of a split there, but yes, we need a suspected colorectal cancer pathway referral. Now remember this patient has presented with possible colorectal cancer and there are very specific guidelines as to what you do in, with patients with suspected colorectal cancer and guidelines as to which patients we should, should suspect have colorectal cancer. So this chap is over 60 years old with change in bowel habit, therefore according to NICE guidelines requires an urgent two week wait for suspected colorectal cancer. Um, so the other tests, most of them are screening tests. So for example, the screening sigmoidoscopy, you're not going to just request that at the GP surgery, you're gonna request this patient to go to a dedicated specialist clinic where the main thing that they're gonna to have to do is do a colonoscopy with biopsy in order to assess for colorectal cancer and confirm the diagnosis. But uh, our textbook has ex the, you know, the precise uh, indications for which patients we refer using a suspected colorectal cancer pathway. So I'm not gonna dwell on these explanations too long because I've just explained it all, but hopefully that makes sense to everyone. We need, the ultimate thing here we need is the colonoscopy and biopsy. Okay, question number three. Seventy-two year old man is recently diagnosed with prostate cancer. Which part of the prostate does prostate cancer most commonly arise from? Five seconds. Let's have a look. Boom. Ooh. Yes. So the majority of you have gone for peripheral zone and you would be absolutely spot on. The majority of prostate cancers arise from the peripheral zone just to help you visualize things a little bit more. That is a basic diagram of some prostate anatomy for you there. So roughly three quarters of prostate cancers arise from the peripheral zone, whereas um, the transitional zone, which some of you put there, that's mostly relevant when it comes to benign prostatic hyperplasia or BPH. So BPH is often actually more symptomatic than prostate cancer because the transitional zone essentially surrounds the prostatic urethra. So BPH, when, um, when the, the transitional zone of the prostate begins to essentially enlarge, it compresses that urethra and you get lower urinary tract symptoms, you know, relatively early on. In, in uh, prostate cancer, because it's the peripheral zone and it's slightly further away from the prostatic urethra, uh, it can take a little bit more time for lower urinary tract symptoms to develop compared to benign prostatic hyperplasia. So that's a little bit of background for you uh, and well done to those who got that correct. A little bit of uh, basic anatomy or pathophysiology for you to, uh, to think about there. All right, number four.
65 year old woman presents with abdominal pain and vomiting, it's got an abdominal x-ray there. What is the most common cause of the underlying condition? You've got enough of the abdominal x-ray there to hopefully be able to make a diagnosis. Ten seconds. Bowel adhesions, lovely, yes. So what condition is this? What is the history and abdominal x-ray suggestive of? Can anyone tell me? SBO, yes, thank you, Ryan A. Yep, that is small bowel obstruction. So a very brief, we've got a whole webinar on small bowel obstruction, a little bit of a lowdown on it. The most common cause of small bowel obstruction is um, bowel adhesions. And the most common cause of those adhesions is previous abdominal surgery. The bigger the operation, the more adhesions are probably going to fall. So something like a massive open laparotomy for something uh, would be a big risk factor, for example. Um, colorectal cancer, which some of you put, is the most common cause of large bowel obstruction. Now, if you weren't sure about the abdominal x-ray, once again, we've got a webinar on abdominal x-ray interpretation as well. On the very basic level, this shows small bowel obstruction because you've got dilated loops of central bowel with fluid levels there as well. You can't really see the bowel of your kind of entities particularly well because of the quality of the film, but centrally dilated loops with um, fluid levels, plus that history, highly suggestive of small bowel obstruction. Well done. We're a quarter of the way there already. Does not time fly? It does indeed. Okay. Question number five. 38 year old man reports severe right sided back pain radiating to the groin and vomiting. Urine dip with red blood cell plus plus. What is your first line imaging? Good, non-contrast, CTKUB. Now this is really, really important to know. You don't want to be unnecessarily, um, well, you don't want to order the wrong investigation essentially, uh, if you're suspecting uh, a renal stone. So you've got a patient, you know, youngish man, uh, loin to groin pain, vomiting, microscopic hematuria. You know, it's probably going to be a stone and then you do a non-contrast CT, kidneys, ureters, bladder, if you're suspecting that, rather than your standard CT of the abdomen, which is going to be your CT abdomen and pelvis with contrast. So, well done. Hopefully a straightforward one. Majority of you got that right. So there you go. Consider the gold standard diagnostic test uh, for suspected renal stones, according to the British Association of Urological Surgeons, I think that stands for. Um, now, the, technically, they say it needs to be performed within 14 hours of admission, in reality, in most hospitals, it's performed a lot quicker than that. Um, good, good. And there is a man who looks remarkably like me, almost, uh, with a renal stone. There you go. Question six. Why is this choice of imaging rather than ultrasounds? Good question. Um, sensitivity and specificity associated with CTKUB. Uh, in renal stones is significantly higher compared to uh, renal tract ultra ultrasound. Um, there, there are some cases where an ultrasound uh, may be preferred, for example, in pregnancy, but the vast majority of cases, um, CTKUB is going to be done. Uh, now, anyway, it used to be slightly differently before. 
All right, cool. Question six. A 19 year old man is referred to urology with suspected testicular torsion. Which clinical feature supports a diagnosis of testicular torsion? Remember, no rush on these ones. Take your time. Ah, well done. I thought that was a bit of a tricky one. Evidently not. Um, friend sign negative, correct. Let me explain very briefly. So, testicular torsion, urological emergency. Seen a fair share of these during my time in A&E. Um, and if you suspect it clinically, these patients should go to theatre, no dilly-dallying. Now, friend sign basically says, um, if it's positive, that when you lift the testes, it causes relief of pain. That's usually seen in conditions like epididymo or chitis. In testicular torsion, when you lift the testes, you're expecting pain not to be relieved. So Prenn's sign is probably going to be negative. The others are incorrect for the reasons described here. But this is why it's so important that your clinical examination is thorough in any person that you suspect to have testicular torsion. So hopefully that makes sense to everyone. Uh, Jamila has raised her hand. Um, I can't see any questions, but I will move on unless there are any questions, let me know. Um, question number seven. Okay, what we got. Which of the following best describes the abdominal aortic aneurysm screening program in England? Three, two, one. Off to men age 65 and over as a one-off abdominal ultrasound. Good. Probably had enough time to, to even Google that, I'll be honest. But yes, that's absolutely right. Um, so it's a really important thing to remember. It's asked a lot in exam, but also remember it in your clinical practice as well. So the screening program in England is offered to all men age 65 and over. You get a one-off abdominal ultrasound. You look at how large the abdominal aorta is, the aneurysm, um, and if it exceeds three centimeters, then you offer further surveillance. Um, and there's a nice table of that in our textbook as well, because that always comes up in exams. Um, lovely. Question number eight. We are whizzing through these. Which of the following is true of esophageal cancer? Look at that short, straight to the point.
All right, let's have a look. It's a bit of a tough one, this one, I would say. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, as expected. So, a little bit of, uh, these ones are definitely hard to, harder to look up, uh, but um, yeah, so this is also a bit of a question about reading the question carefully, because if I had read this and I was trying to answer this question, I would say, oh no, the first line investigation for suspected of esophageal cancer is obviously endoscopy and biopsy, upper GI endoscopy. But remember the question that says, first line staging investigation. So if endoscopy and biopsy confirms esophageal cancer, we're gonna stage CT, chest, abdomen, and pelvis. Um, and I'll explain the other options here as well. So Barrett's is most commonly associated with esophageal adenocarcinoma, um, and Barrett's is secondary to gastroesophageal reflux disease. Um, adenocarcinomas usually affect the lower third of the esophagus because of that instance of gastroesophageal reflux disease. Adenocarcinoma, most common type in the UK, um, and then McEwen's esophagectomies are preferred for proximal tumours. You actually need to do a cervical anastomosis, which is really, really interesting. Um, so feel free to watch a uh, look up on YouTube about this specific type of esophagectomy. It's pretty incredible. Um, but if you remember that there's a cervical anastomosis, you're going to remember that obviously it's going to be proximal. It's not going to be the distal tumour. Um, and really, there's a lot, not a huge amount of questions on surgical, you know, actual procedures per se in exam, but know the bare minimum because the bare minimum usually does come up. Good, that's CT chest abdopelvis. Hopefully that makes sense to everyone. So we need to stage. If we don't stage properly, then you're gonna operate on people who shouldn't be operated on, or you're going to not operate on people who could have been operated on. So staging is so, so key, particularly for our GI malignancies. Um, number nine. An 85-year-old woman reports left lower quadrant abdominal pain, fever, and fresh rectal bleeding. What is the most likely diagnosis? And seconds remaining. Good. Thought I'd chuck in a nice easy one there. Uh, well done. Diverticulitis. Yes. Inflammation of our diverticular. Um, as we grow older, essentially everyone almost are going to have these outpouching of our large bowel called diverticular. As they become inflamed, infected, you can present essentially like this woman did. So elderly patient, left lower quadrant pain, fever, fresh rectal bleeding is going to be diverticulitis, most likely until proven otherwise. Um, not all patients present with all of those features, but particularly their left lower quadrant pain is, is pretty, um, pretty synonymous with diverticulitis within this demographic. The, uh, the other ones are incorrect for the reasons described. Good, that was a pretty straightforward one. So we're halfway, folks. Halfway, hope you're feeling confident. Remember, it's, it's not all about winning. A 67-year-old man is found to have an abdominal aortic diameter of 4.8 centimeters on screening. He's asymptomatic. What is the best course of action? Let's go. Another vascular question for you. Probably wasn't fair to have them that close to each other. Um, but yes, always, as I said, always gets asked. Good. Good. 
three monthly surveillance. I'm going to show you basically the table you need to learn when it comes to your uh, aneurysm sizes and then your subsequent action plan. Um, this is the most recent guidance. The, you've got so discharge. So remember, you've got one off abdominal ultrasound. You do that ultrasound if, it's, if the, if the um, abdominal aorta is less than three centimeters. Uh, then you're going to discharge from screening three to 4.4 centimeters, annual surveillance, 4.5 to 5.4, three monthly surveillance, and 5.5 centimeters or more. Refer to vascular surgeons, most likely is going to be for uh, an elective abdominal aortic aneurysm repair. If this was symptomatic, what would you have done differently? Anyone? If he'd said, I've got this really bad pain in my abdomen, and you measure it, and You've got this maybe leaking aneurysm or something exactly they're going to need emergency surgery get them straight uh, to a and e get them seen by vascular surgeons get them admitted and get them into theater as soon as you can um, good so symptomatic abdominal aortic aneurysms are emergency and i'm not talking symptomatic as in they're dying i'm saying abdominal pain associated with an abdominal aortic aneurysm or secondary to one uh, is an emergency because it suggests rupture is relatively imminent. Good. Well done, everyone. Number 11. A 47 year old woman reports eight months of itching and fatigue. Bloods show a raised ALP, GGT, and bilirubin, and their anti mitochondrial antibody positive. What is the likely diagnosis? Now, this is, a, this is a bit of a tricky one, I must say. Um, but you, knowing you, you uh, folks, you'll probably get it. Okay, let's have a look. PBC, good. Primary biliary cholangitis, previously known as primary biliary cirrhosis, um, is, you know, this is a classic picture of it. 47 year old woman, itching, fatigue, obstructive picture on the bloods and anti mitochondrial antibody positive, highly suggestive of primary biliary cholangitis. Now, we created a table in our textbook. Um, because these two conditions are so commonly um, kind of confused or misunderstood. Um, so we've got separate textbooks on PSC and a separate textbook on PBC, and then this textbook comparing the two. Um, the reason why this is PBC, so you've got middle-aged woman, if you wanted to know that pathophysiology, it's the progressive destruction of your intrahepatic ducts. Um, if you've got fatigue, pruritus, obstructive picture on your liver function test, anti-mitochondrial antibody positive. Um, so really bang on the money when it comes to PVC, I would say. Good. Now this next one is tricky. So I've got, before I dive into this, someone's asked, I'm on Menti, how will you contact the winner? I'm going to give you a reminder at the end but make sure when you get to the end, you screenshot the leaderboard and you send us that leaderboard via ad to admin at biomedicine.com. But I'll show you the final uh, on the final slide as a reminder. A 28 year old woman has her routine survival screening. Her results show high risk HPV positive with normal cytology. What is the best next step? This is a difficult question. I think. The guidance was changed roughly a year and a half ago. So if you haven't heard of high risk HPV, that may be why, but you probably have heard of it now. Good. 
repeat the high risk HPV test at 12 months. It does make logical sense, doesn't it? Um, now, let me explain a little bit more uh, and more to you about that. So cervical screening, if you're not aware of cervical screening, it's offered to all women between 25 years old and 64 years old. We now say that we should test for high-risk HPV, i.e. high-risk strains of the human papillomavirus first, rather than sending everyone for looking at all these cells under cytology. Um, only if you have a high-risk HPV strain, only then will you do cytology. And that's simply because HPV itself is such a strong risk factor for cervical cancer. If you have a negative high-risk HPV, you essentially have normal results. It's how, how this is basically summarized. Um, so the next step is how do we know what to do with all of these results? We created this table here, which is in our textbook. Um, essentially, if you have abnormal cytology, refer to colposcopy, but if your cytology is normal, um, and obviously you're not going to do cytology unless you've done your high-risk HPV. So the assumption is your HPV is, high, is positive anyway. Um, you're going to repeat the test at 12 months. Now, it gets a little bit more complicated as to how you interpret that result at 12 months. So feel free to have a read on that in your own time. But that is this is that, that piece of knowledge that, uh, that we're testing here. And obviously you've got inadequate samples as well, um, which I which, uh, mentioned at the bottom there. But yeah, the vast majority of you got that spot on, so well done. Okay, number 13. A 65 year old man reports aching in his legs when walking. His ankle brachial pulse index is 1.4, which if you weren't aware is high. Which comorbidity may be responsible for this result? Five seconds remaining. Nice. Okay. Diabetes. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Some someone said hypertension. I'm assuming it's just that link between what sounds like peripheral arterial disease and another cardiovascular risk factor. Um, but actually, diabetes is the thing that we are looking for here. Now. Can anyone tell me in the chat why is someone with, with clear peripheral arterial disease based on his symptoms got a high ankle brachial pulse index? Does any, so why, did, why is diabetes causing this? Does anyone know? Hmm. Good, calcification, exactly. You've got, you've got arterial calcification. And when that happens, and it's not just diabetes that can cause that, just so you're aware. Um, Lots of things can cause that, but diabetes is, is most commonly uh, associated with this calcification. This patient has presented essentially with intermittent claudication, which suggests kind of mildish to moderateish uh, peripheral arterial disease. So you would probably expect his ABPI to be somewhere between here. Um, and diabetes is strongly correlated with an increased risk of calcified vessels, far more so than, than hypertension. Um, so other things like, you know, systemic, so SLE, um, other rheumatic conditions can cause calcified blood, blood vessels as well. Um, so essentially, we interpret this as a man who clearly has symptoms of peripheral arterial disease with an abnormally normal ABPI or elevate false negative is essentially what's being caused. So um, you need to interpret the clinical features and they kind of override the ABPI in this case. So hopefully that makes sense to everyone. Number 14. Sixty-five-year-old man reports three months of blood in his urine and left flank pain. He has a dragging sensation in his left 
testicle, what is the diagnosis? I think every med school exam from like third year onwards, they asked some for a version of this question. We're looking for the underlying diagnosis, by the way. Oh, oh gosh. Wow, you, you lot are really good. Yeah, 30, so the majority of you have said um, renal cell carcinoma. Now, the reason why this question is asked so much in exams is because it's a great test of combining your, essentially your anatomy to a patient's clinical presentation. So this triad, so this patient has hematuria and left flank pain, so it's two of your triad of renal cell carcinoma, renal cancer, basically. Um, just so you're aware, 50% of patients with renal cell carcinoma are actually completely asymptomatic. So this triad is a very much a, a characteristic presentation, but very few patients present with that triad, just so you're aware. Now, why if this patient has um, renal cell carcinoma, most likely on the left side because of the left flank pain, why have they got this dragging sensation in their testicle? Well, this is a varicocele that's formed. It causes like a worm-like sensation and a dragging sensation. So a left-sided renal cell carcinoma invade can invade the left renal vein. This can then cause back pressure and varicocele formation via the left testicular vein. And that's because the left testicular vein drains into the left renal vein. So there's back pressure into the testes. This only happens on the left. It doesn't happen on the right. And that's because the right testicular vein drains directly into the IVC. Um, so a right renal cell carcinoma will not cause varicocele uh, in the same way that uh, a left-sided one would. And that's because the right testicular vein drains right in, i.e. right into the IVC. It doesn't go via the, the renal vein. So that's, that's how I remember it anyway. So well done. The, yeah, the majority of you got that right anyway, so it's probably me just talking to myself. But yes, well done, everyone. Number 15, three quarters of the way through. 71 year old woman has a new right-sided headache and pain when chewing. She also has pain in her shoulders. Which diagnostic test is most useful? You could argue this is kind of not entirely a surgical question, um, but there's an overlap. Five seconds. Yes, ESR, absolutely. So yes, uh, someone's asked in the uh, Q&A, more rheumatology. Yeah, I, I would say uh, probably is more rheumatology, but obviously the surgical, what, what is the, okay, two questions. What is the underlying condition and why could this arguably also be under a surgical specialty to a, to a, a smaller degree? Temporal arthritis. Yeah. Yeah, so probably temporal arthritis, AKA giant cell arthritis. So yeah, exactly. Now, um, this is, is it's, a, it's a eye threatening emergency, sight threatening emergency. Um, and any patient, particularly with evidence of visual um, visual impairment is going to need high dose steroids ASAP. So, you know, some might say it's ophthalmology, most are going to say it's rheumatology, so that's a bit cheeky of me. Um, so, uh, yeah, the, the, so this uh, right-sided headache, jaw claudication, 
So it's highly suggestive, well, to a degree, in, in an elderly woman is, is relatively suggestive of um, temporal arteritis. The pain in the shoulders suggests polymyalgia rheumatica, and there's a big overlap between the two conditions. Um, giant cell arteritis is large cell vascu large vessel vasculitis. Um, and I see some mentioned in the chat there, uh, I thought ESR isn't diagnostic alone. The ESR is not diagnostic, agreed. But um, the, I think it's the American Society of Rheumatologists. Or, yeah, I think that's, that's the right uh, organization. Um, this is their guidelines from a few years ago. They said more, uh, three or more criteria if they are met for a positive diagnosis of giant cell arteritis. They then released more recent guidance, I think in 2016, but that hasn't been completely validated yet. So in clinical practice, often we still use um, the, the, uh, the older guidance, which basically says it. So that's why ESR is probably going to be the most useful uh, investigation of, of that lot and could be considered diagnostic alongside some of those uh, other criteria there as well. Um, so yes, steroids, um, the, the, some patients won't need, you know, high dose steroids immediately. You just have a look at the guidelines. We've got a textbook on it as well. Um, but obviously, as we said, it is a site threatening emergency. Nice. Okay, number 16. What is the most appropriate management of a displaced intracapsular neck or femur fracture in an independent 62-year-old with no comor comorbidity? It's a lot of information in one sentence, but yes, have a go. Three, two, one. Total arthroplasty. Good stuff. Good stuff. Now there are some some people say hemi, some saying uh, DHS. Um, why total over hemi? Out of interest in the chat. Based on the limited information we have, why have the majority of you gone for total? Yes. No comorbidities. Independent. Yeah. Exactly. So 62 year old with no comorbidities, who's completely independent, you can do a total replace. You can, uh, th there's no need, based on the information we have anyway, to do, to do a hem. Um, and I, I will, I'll show you the management pathway. So we've got, um, so remember this, so the, the thing here, we've got a displaced intracapsular neck or femur fracture in an independent 62 year old with no comor comorbidities, the hip fracture, in intracapsular, displaced, no significant comorbidities, Total arthroplasty. The, the most of the time you're going to do a hemi within this uh, this this group over here. It's going to be if they're immobile or cognitively impaired. Then you're probably going to consider a hemi over a total uh, arthroplasty. Now remember this this flowchart which we've created, uh, which is a combination of sign guidelines and nice guidelines, um, is mainly based on you know elderlyish patients. And that's because the vast majority of NOFs are obviously in elderly patients. And we're talking about young patients. So for example, someone maybe like you or I who have been in a road traffic accident and had a NOF, um, the management is slightly different because we prefer uh, internal, uh, so basically internal fixation. Because, you know, if these patients are probably going to be a bit more active, if you try and replace a joint in, in a, a normally a fit and healthy 25 year old, um, the, they're going to wear out the joints so quickly. So we tend to like to uh, fix um, NOFs in younger patients rather than replace the joint in younger patients. That's me ram rambling on a little bit. So sorry about that. But yes, good. Majority of you got that correct. The man attends a private clinic for a well man check. He's asymptomatic, abdominal ultrasound only shows gallstones in the bladder. 
what is the next step? Classic well-man check. Harley Street, you want, if you want an advanced well-man check or well-woman check, then Harley Street is the place to go. Heard. Mmm, good stuff. Good stuff, yeah. Uh, why, why only reassurance? It's rarely the answer in questions like these, but why are we saying just reassure them? Yeah, exactly. Asymptomatic, asymptomatic gallstones in the gallbladder. Uh, no need to do anything, really. So there's exactly the words taken from Nice. So reassure people with asymptomatic gallbladder stones found in a normal gallbladder and normal biliary trigger that they do not need treatment unless they develop symptoms. Nothing to do. Reassure them. Of course, if the patient had colic, manage the pain, get them in for an elective um, laparoscopic cholecystectomy in the majority of cases. If uh, acute cholecystitis, then laparoscopic cholecystectomy within seven days, but usually done within 48 hours. Um, and the other ones are incorrect for the reasons described there. So well done, uh, absolutely spot on reassurance. Okay, now we're getting into the territory now where the faster you answer, the more points you get. Now this is a bit, bit of fun. We don't like, as I hope you know by now, we don't like to support this notion of speed and accuracy, but uh, this is just for a bit of fun. The faster you answer, more points you get. A 72-year-old man has recently been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Which of the following markers can be used to monitor disease progression? Good. Once again, well done to the uh, 46 of you. Fantastic stuff. Uh, CA99. Remember, these tumor markers are not diagnostic. CA99 is not diagnostic of pancreatic cancer. It is most useful in, in monitoring your disease progression in pancreatic cancer. So, uh, CA125 is ovarian cancer. AFP is often, you know, liver, liver cancer and uh, some type, certain type of testicular cancer. CEA is colorectal cancer. Thyroglobulin is a differentiated thyroid cancer. An ultimate question, ultimate question alert. Um, let's do it. A 32 year old man reports hematuria and flank pain. He's diagnosed with a 21 millimeter staghorn calculus. What is the best management option? requires some urological knowledge. Five seconds. Well done. Well done. I mean, there's a bit of a split there, understandably. It's, it's, a, it's a tricky question. Um, you know, neurological management of renal stones is not, from my experience, taught particularly well at medical school. People don't 
know these different types of procedures necessarily. They don't know which one you use for what type of stone, which ones are more you know, emergencies uh, than, than others. When do you use medical expulsive therapy? What is medical expulsive therapy? It's not, they're not taught particularly well. Um, but this is a stag form calculus, with, which is a big, big, fat uh, stone, which essentially um, fills up the, 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 almost the entirety of the pelvic calocele system. Now, um, what a percutaneous nephrolithotomy is, is that you access the renal collecting system uh, via the skin, so percutaneously you do an incision in the back, um, and you can get rid of the stone that way. Now, unfortunately, I don't have a mass amount of time to go into every single one of these um, treatment types and when you do each of them, but our textbook gives this summary, which is based on British Association of Urology guidelines and NICE guidelines, essentially combined. They, they don't entirely agree, that the two organizations don't entirely agree on everything, but using basic common sense, this is uh, a general consensus that have come up with. So ESWL is uh, lithotripsy, URS is urethroscopy, um, and PCNL is what, we just, what we've just been talking about. So this patient is staghorn, so fat staghorn calculus. Um, we're going to do PCNL. It's called a staghorn calculus because when the stone fills up that pelvic calocele system, it looks like the horns of a stag. So that's why we call it that. Um, but the textbook talks a little bit more detail about what each of these procedures actually is as well. So well done. Last question, perfect timing as well. Last question of the day, last question of the competition. Can't remember what this is, but hopefully I've ended it up on a high, probably not. 72 year old man reports aching and burning of his lower legs when walking. Again, ABPI is 0.7. What is the most appropriate first line management option? Ten seconds left. Three, four. Well, good stuff. Supervised exercise program. Very, very much advocated by NICE now for patients with kind of mild to moderate peripheral arterial disease. Um, the first line, and is essentially offered to all patients with PAD, um, it's defined by NICE as a community-based exercise program, including hospital and gym-based exercise, supervised by health professionals, um, two hours per week for up to three months. You don't necessarily need to learn every single point of that. It's explained more in the textbook, but yes, this patient who has intermittent claudication with an ABPI of 0.7, Supervised exercise program would be great for him alongside, of course, managing his cardiovascular um, comorbidities, et cetera. Well done. I think it is the moment of truth. But before I reveal the results, remember this. If you are placed in the top three, take a picture or take a screenshot of the leaderboard and please email it to us at admin at bitemedicine.com. Um, people are saying, mess well, one person has uh, said, please don't show the leaderboard. The leaderboard only reveals the top 10 people. You can't see anything more than the top 10 people. Um, and uh, unless I reveal the leaderboard to you, you won't be able to know whether where you have come in, in that top 10. Um, so. Don't worry about it. If you like, I won't reveal it on the screen to everyone, but I can. Uh, you can have a look on your phones anyway, so I will not share it on the big screen uh, if, that, if that's helpful. So let me um, 
go over here. I'm going to bring up the leaderboard. I will pause my screen sharing. There we go. Sammy, Lydia, Maram, take a bow. That is absolutely phenomenal work. Absolutely phenomenal. Um, please do take a note of your position and um, let us know. Please send us an email to uh, admin at bitemedicine.com. You can all see the leaderboards now, hopefully on your, uh, on your phones. Um, as I said, you can only see the top 10. So if you'd like to see what this looks like, this is what it looks like. Um, so Sammy, well done. Lydia, Maram, also uh, well done. And, and well done to everyone for participating. There were roughly a hundred of you in total who took part. Um, and as we said, it's not the, uh, the taking part. It's not, wait, it is the taking part. It's not the winning that counts. Um, but we will have more competitions. I think we've got the medical one coming up as well. Um, hopefully you've got the screenshot on your phone if you're in the top three. We will send your prizes as soon as we hear from you via email. Um, we would love your feedback, of course, as always. Um, we hope, well, I hope you've really, really enjoyed today. If you've enjoyed it, let us know, give us feedback. We can do them more often. We can give out more money, whatever you want. Um, and let us know if there's any help we can uh, we, we can be of uh, in your study, particularly as we head back into the academic year fully fledged. Um, yeah.